I am in bits. Oh yeah? Yeah, my back, it's sore. I've been tossing Did you catch rubber. anything? Of course I did. What? I'm not telling you. Oh, I'm bothered Secret. anyway. Here we go then, Alex, episode three. What we're going to call this one. We're calling this, actually, I know what we're calling this one. It's called The Deadly Duo. Um, that, it's not me and you. It's our guests on this week. But I'll explain who we've got on in a minute. Okay, before we get into things, just to remind people how you can listen to us. Uh, Apple Podcast, Podbean Podcast, Google Podcast. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Fenland Fishing TV, you can hear the audio on there as well. Just to let people know about the YouTube, still having problems getting it, getting the podcast published exactly the same time as the uh, podcast on the other channels. It's completely out of our control, but it will go on YouTube at some point on the Wednesday. Update with the Fenland Guardian scheme, Alex. We had lots of interest from that from last week. Good. Which was good. Brilliant. Yeah, I had several guys contact me to join the group, and I had three people who asked me to join as Guardians or Ambassadors. So that was really nice. So we are yeah. we're expanding, and the Pike Anglers Club of Great Britain have been in contact, and I've written a little, little article to go in their next magazine, and I think we're going to have uh, a bigger spread the magazine after. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, yeah, and I think other people involved in angling, I'm not going to say too much else yet, have been making contact and saying, well done, what a great idea. So that's good. So we'll mm -hmm. see how this um, expands in the next few weeks. Right, we've got lots to talk about. You had a warm-up. Practice match, yeah. Yep, for yeah. next week. Yeah. Where was that? Benick. Good old Benick. Benwick. Benwick, yeah. Um, yeah, it was it's standard Benick, really. Sort of bit, you know, normally it's the team aspect side of things and the social, it's starting to be a bit boring now. You can't, you know, what you used to do is, is sort of a bit frustrating, really, you know, going back to the pub afterwards and having a chat and having the banter and that side of things and... I don't know, it's a bit... You, know, you spend more time sat in your living room on your phone, messaging and taking pictures and working out who's caught what and messaging people, ringing people and mm. Zoom meetings and stuff like that. And it's just, I don't know. It's better, you know, better to be like getting that. Getting a bit boring at the minute. It's, yeah, uh, but it's better to be like that than not fishing. So It is, yeah. We'll that is one thing. Have to see but, what's um, going to happen over the next... I think, is he making an announcement tonight? Uh, yes. Yeah. Three-tiered system yeah. or something? yeah. So uh, we're pretty fortunate where we are, that fairly low yeah. R rate, if that's the correct term. Yeah, we've just got to keep to what we're doing really, haven't we? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Just keep... Straight forward. Yeah, and just keep fishing. And, yeah. But we'll talk about Ben Wick at the end. Yeah. But I must say, I did notice that uh, Polly... Yeah. Yeah, he's done it again. He's done it again. Yeah. He goes on these little runs where he wins like six mega big matches in... Six weeks and it's like, how? Do you know what I mean? Just how? How does he do it? It's amazing, really. He has know? gills. Yeah. 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 We need to get him on again. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. Yeah. We do. I'll have to ask him on that one. Yeah. Right now, in the match fishing scene, who, off the top of your head, would you say is kind of the rising stars, and? Is just a really nice guy. Obviously, there's loads and loads. Um, I'll put you in a position here, haven't I? You have, really, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so many old school anglers that have been around and done it and probably a little bit under the radar, you know, but um, up and coming, I mean. As in, England team. Oh, well, yeah, that's obviously, that, that's quite an easy one. Obviously, Matt Godfrey is, you know, he's a smashing lad. He's a laugh a minute, and he's pretty special at fishing as well. Right, so. there we go. I've got the Matt Godfrey of the lure fishing world on this week. Really? Two of them, yeah. I Are they ginger from Yorkshire? 
No, they're not. Oh, right. no. Yeah. Oh. I'm good. I wasn't going to say what was in my head then. I got all, but no. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, does he stink of <laughs> as well? <but> no. <laughs> no. Oh, God. Oh, I'm tired. Right. Um, no, I started doing a bit of lure fishing, a bit of lure competition fishing a couple of years ago. And you know how you notice yep. who are like, you go, they, they look good. Naturally good. Naturally good. You, can, you think, the way they're going about things. I, I noticed these two guys, and their boat, you should have seen the state of their boat, it was, the, it was full of water, there's gear everywhere. And mm. I just started talking to one of them, and this was a bit unknown, unknown for me from the pike background. He mm. talked back. Right. Normally in pike fishing, you talk to somebody and they just blank you. Right. Or you, I don't talk, you know, I just won't talk to anybody. Is that just a Fenham way? Though, no, it's know? a pike fishing right. thing, yeah. Right. Anyway, so I started talking to this guy, and his name's Tom. And uh, I thought, oh, he's a nice guy, and he was t- t- talking about these things and whatever. And his boat partner was called Kev- Kevin, and uh, I started talking to, him, talking to him in this match, and it very quickly became apparent that they are really top class lure anglers. They are like. Last year they were picked for the England lure fishing boat team, mm-hmm. but unfortunately the World Championships in Poland got postponed because of COVID, which should have been this year, so mm-hmm. that'll be next year. And I've been watching their progress on several lure fishing competitions, and they're always there or thereabouts. They are just smashing on it. it. They're on it. And also, they are really, really, really nice blokes as well. You can speak to them about something, and they're really honest, and they help you, give you advice, tell you what they've done. And it's really refreshing that you've got people in the sport who are very talented and just genuinely nice people. Mm-hmm. And for me, coming from the potty fishing background, it was like a breath of fresh air. <clears throat> oh dear, getting old. So what I thought would be really good was to get them on the podcast. So we had the Lure Angler Society, uh, I think it was the Predator Cup at Rutland, the second week in September. And... I got the guys on the podcast and we did a 45 minute slot of what makes them tick and how they fish together in a boat. So it's team fishing basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their whole ethos and the way they go about it is something special. So for all you maggot drowners out there who might go, oh, I don't listen to this. Listen to this. This is amazing. These two are really special. They are top of their game and they're going to start going into tournaments in Europe, which is a really big thing for English lure anglers, because, you know, we're, we're not there or thereabouts with these, uh, these guys from Europe. So they kind of spell out what they do. They delve into a little bit of how they compete and how much practice they put in. But um, I just want to introduce Kev Cox and Tom Hunt, and hopefully everybody enjoys this as much as I did. I'm in a hotel room with Kevin Cox and Tom Hunt. Evening, gentlemen. Hi, Randy. Hello, mate. Very good to, uh, to be on the podcast. No, it's great. I really appreciate your time because we've just come off Rutland Water fishing the Lower Angle Society event and we're all a bit jaded. And uh, I know Kevin in particular is looking forward to a pint. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a long day. Hell of a wind on today. Yeah, however, you guys once again have smashed it. So congratulations, you've won the event again. So that's really good. And this is the reason why I've got you guys on, because I started competition lure fishing briefly two years ago, and I'm not very good at it, and I've spotted two guys straight away. You won't remember me talking to you in a boat two years ago on the WPC, and I said to Eric, these guys are cane in it. And uh, I've been keeping my beady eye on you both, and you two are, I think, probably the hottest property in lure competition fishing in the UK at the minute. You're doing really well. We're pretty, we're pretty consistent. I think we base a lot of our, yeah, a lot of our pride on, we always fish to win and, and, you know, you can't win them all, but, but we're very consistent with most competitions that we enter. And I think that's probably the thing I'm proudest of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're always, always setting out to be at least in the top three, aiming to be up there, but um, primarily we're there to win really. Well, you've won today. Yeah. What was your overall weight, uh, length? Because sorry, I said weight. Then you see, that's the old, old piker <laughs> in me. What was your overall length today? Uh, We've had meters eighty-two centimeters. Two what? Meters. No, one meter. Oh, sorry, 82. one meter, one meter eighty-two centimeters. And let's break yeah. this down. So you had a you had a monster pike of one hundred and eleven centimeters. Yeah, uh, yeah, a fed one of one hundred and eleven, and. Um, 
Tom's pulled together the other bits we needed, so we then had Pike and Perch to fill the card up. Um, it yeah, so it's the formats one Pike, one Perch, one Xander today. So it's quite a cool kind of mixture of species. Kev's been an absolute monster on the Pike today. He's had a 109, a 99, a 111, so two yeah. 20s and and a mid double as well. And then I've scratched together a few Perch and Xander <laughs> to fill our card. Oh, you've done brilliant. I mean, did you, you didn't weigh the pike, Kev, did you? Uh, we weighed one, but I mean, we were in a competition situation, so without sounding blase, yes, it's a really big fish and a fish we're all trying to catch. But unfortunately, sometimes in these competition situations, you, um, you find yourself overlooking weights and stuff like that. We're obviously concentrating on the, on the length. That's what the competition is, is built up on. Um, but yeah, we did weigh one of them, and it was you know twenty two ish somewhere around there. It's a rocking boat in a in a landing net. We're not after exact pounds and ounces, but um, about you know low twenty. And I would think the other one was twenty pound as well, wouldn't it? Probably, yeah. probably slightly heavier actually. The the shorter fish might have been slightly heavier. Yeah, I reckon they were sort of twenty two and twenty three pound today. See, said. I was talking to Tom at the end. That blows my mind because I I have to weigh them because I don't get any idea of what they. They do and don't weigh, so I have to yeah. slow down, get the scales out, <laughs> start weighing them. But that's amazing. It is fantastic. Now, I'm going to explain to the maggot drowners, because we have a lot of match anglers listen to the podcast, of who you are in a minute, because they'll be going, who, who are these guys? Because they're very uninitiated, and I need, I need to train them over the, over the following <laughs> year. I've been, you know, for predator fishing, and particularly the lure angling, because that's a, a, a massive growing sport, isn't it, in the UK? Would you agree, the lure fishing side? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's absolutely booming. Um, there's a lot of people getting into it of all ages and, and from all backgrounds. I think it's very accessible to everyone. I would say once you get to fish in the likes of where we are today, Rutland and Grafham and the other big waters, you're kind of becoming a lot more specialist again. But certainly lure fishing as a whole, yeah, it's definitely on the up in the UK. Yeah, it seems to be. Because what I'd like to do, I'm, I'm going to ask Kev and Tom to come on in, back on the podcast individually later on in the year because they're both really, really top-class lure anglers and it doesn't do either of them justice to have them on together, but they are a really good team as well, so it kind of makes sense tonight to look at the team side and then um, I'm going to harass them later on in the year and we'll get them on individually. Because also, um, they are really good lure anglers and Tom, you're all sponsored by Weston and other other guys yeah yeah so i've got a deal with westin uh minkota and hummingbird and uh predator tackle as well yeah yeah you did some q a um blog what vlog what would you call them yeah there was just the live live q a's we were getting on other experts from all around europe and um yeah i think especially during lockdown it was just amazing people were so craving their fishing you know, like, but they couldn't go. Everything was on lockdown. No one could go fishing. And the next best thing is just to talk about fishing. So, yeah, um, yeah they got really popular. And I enjoyed the one with Jorgen. Oh, yeah, yeah, mate. He is just a wealth of knowledge. You know, getting, having people like that in the Western team and, and having access to people like that and Luke Coppens and, you know, it's just, it doesn't get any better than that. They're, they're the pinnacle of European predator anglers. They're at the forefront of, of designing lures and, and knowing people and contacts and, and competitions and stuff. So, yeah, I think that's a big aim of ours now as well is to start moving across to Europe uh, for, for competitions for me and Kev. So Big time. Yeah. yeah. And Kev, you're sponsored by Fox. And yeah. who else? Yeah, I've got full backing from Fox, which I've had for probably f about five years now, which... Um, it really does help in competition situations. You can get your hands on the gear you need, you know, new gear and, and very good good gear at that. Um, also, um, Salmo, which provides us with all our crankbaits and great pipe baits, um, which is fantastic. And then Luz as well, which provides us with our reels and stuff. So, yeah, it's brilliant. Nice that to have good. the back in and support and, you know, the, the confidence that they have in us to, you know, help promote the brand and, and use all their, their equipment to the best of our, our ability, really. Well, I've seen several videos of yourself on the Fox YouTube channel as well. Yeah. I like the one on Grafham. Um, you did, there was a couple I saw on there. You, it, people need to try this out and try and catch different species in the same day from these big waters. It is not easy. It looks easy, but it's not. And you did a fantastic one where you were catching um, perch and zander and you had the pike as well. Yeah. And you hit in different spots. And everyone, anybody wants to get into lure fishing if they start... Looking at those YouTube videos, it gives you an idea of 
some of the different st techniques and strategies involved? Yeah, I mean, there's just a massive amount of, um, of available knowledge on, on YouTube and such like. I mean, Tom's done quite a few himself. Um, I've done quite a few with Fox, but there's a lot to be learned. I spend myself hours and hours and hours watching what I would class as much better anglers than myself and learning from them. There's a lot to be learned. If you pay attention to a lot of these videos, there's lots and lots and lots of information to draw from them. Yeah, there is, yeah. I think we'll get on to, we might get onto that later on today, but this is certainly some of the things I'd like to talk to you about individually later on in the year because it, I think it doesn't matter if you're a, a lure competition angler, whether you're a match angler, uh, as in traditional maggots and whatever, or even like myself, someone who goes out in the middle of the fen in the winter trying to catch a big pike. It's the same kind of mindset. You've got to keep learning new things and trying out different techniques with, with whatever field you're in because it keeps you fresh and it makes you a better angler. Yeah, you need to be learning all the time. I mean, one thing that me and Tom will always come away from the boat with is even if we've had a good or a bad day, we've always learned something. There's always something we've picked up, always something that we tend to then spend the next two hours driving home chatting about or on the phone discussing. But I think that's what makes us a team, is that we've got the same aim. That's you know. Well, that was one of my questions later on, but let's touch on it now because you've brought it up. Because you're very good individual anglers, but you've come together as a team and you've started fishing together for how long now? Go on, it's Tom, probably been... Uh... I don't know, the two first, or three years, I think. The first trip was Chew. That was an eventful. It was, eventful trip yeah, as well. yeah. So the first time we were on a boat together, Kev had a thirty-two eleven out of Chew. Um, yeah, that was an absolute peach. It was. A, oh, we had this beautiful mist that day as well. It was, it was flat day. as a pancake with this cold winter mist. And uh, yeah, we had about, I think you had 17 pike that day, and 16 of them were about a pound, and yeah. one of them was 32, 32 11. So um, yeah, that was that was a memorable trip on the first Isn't go. Isn't that a beautiful place to fish? Oh, lovely! Yeah, yeah. two valleys, yeah. lovely. Yeah. 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 yeah, really nice. Yeah, we were, in fact we were on there in February this year yeah. uh, for Kev's birthday. It was his fortieth birthday, and we had a twenty each that day as well. That was a that was a good day, and twenty odd pike to the boat. And so was that a competition when you first started, or was it just a pleasure? No, it was just just pleasure fishing. Um, myself and Tom had sort of bumped into each other at, at Chew Valley as you're always doing the car parks and you know, like South Andy when people are just chatting and you're having a gavel and a bit of a chat online and it just so happened unfortunately for Tom's friend but he couldn't couldn't make that, that mm. day so um I gladly jumped on board and <laughs> um, and, it, and it's gone from there really. I mean we've pretty much fished together ever since then and as soon as the opportunity was there to fish competitively together we sort of I think it was WPC might have been but or there was one that we just strolled into and um, we're like we do alright at this and yeah. we kind of complement each other with our fishing big time so um, you know it's um, well let's just, just go a bit deeper because this is, it's, you're, you're actually dumbing this down because I've, I've been what you know I've been watching you because uh, <laughs> I'm there going oh this is so hard they're thrashing everybody What? how are they so good and I'm, I'm watching you and picking up little bits and you, you complement each other perfectly in a boat so when you first fished at Chew did you realise there was kind of a bit of chemistry there as a team? Yeah I think I think you first notice really that you that you're just on a boat with someone that you can get on with you know we probably share boats with a variety of different people and sometimes it's a great relaxed day and sometimes it's quite competitive and sometimes it's a bit of a laugh and it's just about having a laugh but I think we really noticed quite quickly that that we had a lot of shared values, you know, so that's really the kind of basis for, for what makes us a good team. And then when I think it comes down to individual skill sets, you know, I've sort of explained this to, to people before, but I think there's there's a Venn diagram where I'm I'm a little bit more at the finesse end of stuff. And I think Kev is a little bit more at the power end of stuff. Uh, but there's a, a huge crossover in the middle that kind of keeps us both very, very hungry to like be learning. I'm learning stuff of him all the time. I hope likewise yeah, he picks up stuff from me. And it's the conversations that we're having all of the time, the desire to want to do well, to want to better ourselves, to want to learn more. Like Kev just said, we, you know, we're individually spending hours and hours on YouTube because we're trying to learn the whole time as well. You know, and when you put that volume of effort in. Uh, that's when you start seeing seeing results. Yeah, so. it's quite interesting. So you're, you're actually learning off each other. 
you're finding it very uh, engaging and you're driving each other forward all the time as well. Oh, and, hugely. And you're yeah. open-minded because you're picking up new tips, techniques, and off other things that you see. Yeah. Because we were off air talking about the musky fishing, weren't we? And, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, it's, and you were sort of, and I could see your eyes lighting up and you were just picking my brains about that. And it's, it is, it's having that open mind. Um, very famous local pike angler called Dennis Smith, and he'll hate me for mentioning his name on air. We were <laughs> stood in the queue at Rutland on Tuesday, or it might have been Wednesday, the, the days are blurred into one. And this guy has caught more than his fair share of massive pike, but he just keeps everything really secretive. He always has done, he's that's the type of person. But he turned around to me and said, I've got to an age now whereby you can get too blinkered. You think you know it all, and you don't. And he says, you have to throw it completely open again. Yeah. And when he takes people fishing, he doesn't tell them what to do or give them, he gives them general advice. But he says, I stand back and watch what they do because they'll do something that I would never have thought about and they'll catch something. Yeah. And I think it's, it's quite refreshing to have that approach. But whether, I think whether you're, you know, a bait angler or a lure angler or, or a match angler or whatever it is, there's always, I think that's the common thing that we have about angling because all of our, you know, your Kev's history has got barbel and, and chub and, and tench and stuff in it. I came from a traditional match fishing background, you know, loving my team events, loving my pole fishing, canal fishing and that sort of stuff. But like... I think there's a common denominator with all anglers and that is the fact that you can never learn it all. Every single day is always slightly different and I think that is the beauty of it. You know, you come away, even sometimes the most frustrating days are the ones you need most, you know, because they make the great days feel greater and they, you know, you you can always, if you've got the right philosophy and the right mindset, you can always learn something and then you go, Oh, I want to go back next time with a different colour lure and I want to go back next time and get that right where I got it wrong and that's the beauty of fishing it's completely endless yeah you know, it's spot on we had, a comp- we had a conversation about perch fishing which I have no interest in but I have to get better at and now I'm you've totally um, invigorated me to have a go for the perch properly so I can target them in a competition and that's what it's all about isn't it yeah and it's having it's been able to have the open conversations with people as well because in the predator world, it gets very cloak and dagger. Can do, yeah, can yeah, do a, can bit, a bit, yeah. Jackie, definitely. Yeah, and I think what I've noticed by meeting guys like yourselves is you have a completely different mindset to that. You're incredibly open. You'll you'll give people advice. Uh, you're incredibly modest about it because you are. You've you've won a game today, and I want you to give me a little back catalogue of what you've won recently because <laughs> this will be amazing for people listening. But you are really really good at but you. You're so open about talking to people and giving them tips and advice of what you've caught and where. Because I think you just there's so many parameters to to put in a day together that we could tell everybody what's happened today and then go out tomorrow and it's completely different. Yeah. So there's there's bits that you would sort of keep to yourself. There's little little tiny edges that we you know eke out here and there. But I think as a whole, it's just you've got to. Um, physically understand what's going on that day and and in them conditions and at that that time of day as you know yourself you know the pike have come on the feed today and you've noticed a certain time like myself and Tom have caught at very very similar times to you um so so much can change all the time look I'm quite happy to let people know what you know what we've been doing and how we've got on really yeah and it's also just there's there's a few people in I suppose all aspects of angling that are so secretive. Angling's a very, very social sport as well. And I certainly, for one, wouldn't want my name to go round. Like I, I could sit here and I won't, but I could sit here and name a few people that were actually at the event today that are pretty famous for being pretty tight or telling you the wrong thing or being a bit shady. And actually, I just don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that's lying to people or telling them, you know, getting them off the scent. I'd rather actually just have an honest conversation with someone, see how they got on. You know, maybe they'll they'll tell you honestly what they got to. And then actually the next time and the next time and the next time you end up building friends rather than building barriers, you know. So I think it's really important just I would both get on like that. Yeah, yeah. I've that's, always that, those friends then are more people that you learn little snippets from. Yeah, you know that chat in the car park after an event 
can be extremely valuable whether you've been out there and won for the day or you've been out there and blanked there's always always bits of information you can pick up at the end of the day that you can bring next time yeah and i think it's all these little uh, facets that have are making you as a team really well you're, you're unbeatable at the minute it's, and you, you're so open that you're putting in lots of information, aren't you? And, yeah, yeah. And people are open with you because they, you're transparent. Yeah. Well, I always, I also le- learned something when I was young as well, and that was, um, and this was through fishing. It was more in the match fishing world. Um, but basically, if I remember uh, having a conversation with someone about Alan Scotthorn, and you know he's been five times world champion hugely looked up to people like that and I learned so much from that that I've now brought into my lure fishing but but one thing in particular was uh, I remember having a brief conversation with him once and I was I was a kid and I was like oh my god this is the most amazing thing this is like world champion you get to talk to like your heroes and stuff and had a conversation that he was so open and transparent it was at one of these angling shows you know like a big one style thing and and someone said He's so comfortable, he could tell you everything and he could still beat you. And I took that away <laughs> thinking like, oh, I wonder if I could be like that one day. Wonder, do you know what I mean? And it's, and it's, it's slightly risky because you might be giving away some tips to people. But actually, the other thing is, what happens if I tell you everything and then I can still beat you? I then know that I'm, you know, I, and then I'm working on my percentage gains rather than my secrets. Well, I've got a little story about uh, Alan Scott Hall. We had Tom Scody on last year who owns Catch More Media. Yeah, I know Tom, okay. yeah. And he's brilliant. And we asked him some questions because he's met the whole plethora of these top match anglers. Who did he rate as his, the best match angler? And it was Alan Scott Hall. Yeah. And I said, why? He said... He just does his attention to detail and his his, eth, his hard work ethic is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. He says he he will put more um, preparation into it than anybody else he's ever met, and he's just completely focused on what he's doing and he just um, absorbs the whole thing. You can learn from the best. I mean, we we put a lot of effort in, but we could probably put a little bit more in, couldn't we? Right. There's always, always, always <laughs> areas we can improve. We love a beer too. Yeah. You see. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I should, no, I'm not going to stay unless I get more secrets off you, but I have to go. Right, no, what, now, one thing I wanted to ask you both so that our listeners can see who you are and understand who I'm talking to, because we have a lot of match anglers that listen to the podcast, is I just want a little, sort of the last two years of the events that you guys have won individually and as a team, because it's you're getting a, an, an impressive list of wins or, um, I should say, podium finishes. So where would you like... Can we go in some sort of chronological order, i.e. from today oh, back... Totally I think I might... I'm, I'm very bad. I tend to I just, might even like, have this written down. I thrive on that weekend that, you know, um, we've done well or... I mean, be, prime example, it's really difficult at the moment with a certain series of competitions where Tom's... Um, myself and Tom are fishing in the boat, but we're actually competing against each other and not fishing as a team. So uh, yeah, Tom handed me a good um, a good backside slap in last week. And absolutely <laughs> battered me. Well, let's let's but, mention that, Kev, because this yeah. uh, this format I think is brilliant. So can you explain what the format is for these three matches? So it's a series of three competitions on uh, Grafham, Rutland, and Pittsford. The first one was on Pittsford, uh, which was last weekend, and that was Pike Maniacs. So uh, it was myself and Tom fishing together, but against each other so that makes it difficult because as a team you're fishing for the fish that you know are in certain areas and fishing individually in a boat you're competing for those same fish um but we still keep a good a good um jest with it we don't get you know it doesn't get too serious but um yeah i had one pipe tom smashed it to bits filled his card added a few upgrades and um and yeah won another event so <laughs> that was the first one but it's live isn't it in a kind of way because you can top up yeah so it's, it's done um, via an app as well so the app is live so you can actually see what is being caught in and around you that actually worked against us slightly last week because um, you can see the GPS areas of where fish have been caught and myself and Tom put a few fish on quickly at a certain time of day and we went from being the only boat in a bay 
to 10 or 12 oh, boats. An absolute bay. bloody armada started <laughs> coming over towards us. Yeah, one of those boats then went on to take the biggest fish of the day right in front of us. Uh, um, yeah. So that could have potentially been another fish that myself or Tom could have added to the scores. Um, but yeah, that was Pipe Maniacs. Um, after today's battering out there in the wind, we've now got another one tomorrow, which is um, Xander Cup. So that's five, your best five Xander. So really, and that's really, individual again? That's individual. That'll be individual. That's the second round of the three-part series, isn't yeah. it? But, um, so um, I need to win this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, in all seriousness, in, in all fairness, I mean, if Tom's in a good position, then he needs to be up there and winning it because you know he's already got one on the card so if he can get two out of the three of the series wrapped up then that's a um that's a big stepping stone to winning it so that'd be nice and yeah then the, on grapham it's the perch on grapham it's them perch and that's cup, right up our yeah, street as well which is our type of fishing um but you're gonna have to put f- f- five three pounders on the board i heard of a 412 that came out was yeah, yeah. Uh, opening yeah. day yeah yeah yeah, there'll be some fives as well. Yeah, there'll there be some, be some scraper fives, fives yeah. this year. Yeah, because you you can always tell at Grafton with the perch sizes because um, year on year, there's certain the the si- shoal sizes go down, but the lengths consistently get go up. So if you can find the right types of areas that are holding those perch shoals, and they're they're kind of forty seven and forty eight centimeters. So the so, year classes that are getting bigger, <laughs> yeah, and bigger. But yeah. obviously, one or two fish are coming out off out of the pods because they're dying. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the yeah. Are definitely getting less. So, but the fish are definitely getting yeah. bigger, particularly yeah. the perch. Yeah, I need to get into perch fishing because. Uh, Mate, it's amazing on the right kit, they you know, like they're, 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 they're unbelievable yeah. fish, they really are. I just um, love catching big pike. I know. It's going to be today. I've got a few got from yet. sort of 2017, 2018 Let's and whatever. Sort of um, so chronologically, um, well the first comp I ever won actually was in 2017. I got into it in about 2017. 15 2016 uh and and to be perfectly honest didn't do very well it takes a while to get your match fishing head into your lure fishing competitions but um yeah lacc predator pairs win i uh, had a third on another canal uh, match on the basin state canal uh ll series on the gloucester canal that was for xander and pike I had a win there uh predator maniac at chew valley so that was the one i won last weekend i came second two years ago uh, kev was fourth on that day um tuss's specimen challenge champion uh oxford mania on the river thames that's pike chubb perch and Xander came second on that uh the, the biggest win we've ever had is the gunky iron tournament which is 160 odd anglers from all over europe it was fished in rotterdam over two days and that was absolutely amazing. That's been the pinnacle of... You, you, did you win that one? We won that one, yeah. It was the largest yeah. street fishing competition. Oh, stri- ah, with yeah. Frederick Julian. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, so, he's a great guy, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we've had LES Predator Cup. So I won that. So that, that was when it was... in. This year was the first year it was pairs, but it was individual. So I was... I won it... Uh, two years ago and Kev was third yeah. and then last year when it was individuals you came second, second and I came fourth and then we've won it again this year I think yeah. we were quite it's, Rutland suits us for this format as well because there's not many people that can do Pike, Perch and Xander all in one day so that's quite good uh, True Valley Pike Fly Fishing Champion 2019 WPC UK we came third last year we're fourth this year um Zander Cup WPC, won that last year. You were but you were unlucky both tournaments. I felt because last year you were second after the first day. Yeah, Is that right. Yeah, yeah. and this, this year were you second? No, last year no, we were leading. Uh, leading yeah. Yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had a brilliant day one last year. Yeah, and we had a brilliant start to day two last year. But um, we needed a pike because like what we've caught today really. That's what let us down. Seventy. Yeah, seventy nine was our biggest pike last yeah. year. We well, I remember last year because yeah. obviously me and Eric, um, I, I fish Grafton for years, but it was watercraft had let me down. I hadn't been using my electronics properly, so we've been out practicing. I got completely, I got just got it wrong. And I remember coming on the first day, and your boat was half full of water. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what have they been doing? And there was gear everywhere, and yet you were like, oh. And I was 
so how did you get on? Yeah, I had a really good day. Was it? Was that the day you had the big Xander? No, that was the no, second. That was the next day. day. Yeah, yeah. The sixteen pounds. But, but the second day when you came in, your boat was again half full of water. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I thought, what? I think the pump, the uh, the old bilge <laughs> pump, the on it pump wasn't. Was rubbish, yeah, and the waves from memory that was blowing a hoolie, wasn't it? And um, yeah, that's what a lot of people don't understand. And I've said on one or two of our Fox videos is that. Going out on these waters, it can be beautiful blue sky, but a slight breeze will get you soaking wet. Yeah. And it's purely because of the waves crashing into it. But, yeah, from memory, we did have a few injuries <laughs> in the bottom <laughs> of the boat. Unbelievable. Yeah. I was thinking, what? And I was, I was having a sneaky look at your nerves, thinking, they're not using anything a bit different. They're a bit smaller. What am I doing wrong? And it, that's what got me. That's what I thought, I need to start speaking to these guys because they yeah. know what they're doing. But I think WPC must be on your list of... Uh, oh. That... We're desperate to win that one. Yeah, last year we were leading on day one. We've ended up third. We should have been second by a centimetre, actually. Um, but, it, you know, lure fishing's heavily skewed towards the big win as well, you know. Um, this year we were second after day one. We've ended up fourth. But we fished for a win as well. We could, yeah, have, been we could have been third. We could have wrapped up third. But it would have cost us going for the win. So we've gambled and gone for the win and dropped a place. But... Um, yeah, I mean, you've won, you won uh, LAS Perch Cup as yeah, well, didn't you? Yeah, there's a few others on there, Perch Cup and... Um, a Xander Cup, we won Xander Cup last year, uh, yeah. Vlad's won. Quite a few um, of the black events when they was on back in the day, one at Priory Park, one at Warwick Canal, um, Tiverton Canal and Frasley Canal in the top three, so yeah. I think most of the ones we entered, we finished in, or well, certainly in the black, in the beer, the... British Lure Angling Championship. Um, most of the ones that I entered back then, we was finishing in the frame generally. But I think that's because the way that series was run is what as soon as you had finished in the frame, you had got a ticket to the final. So I then continued to fish all the qualifiers just because of my competitive nature, I suppose, and and just being there. But because you've got no pressure on, you fish even better. Yeah. So you yeah. can find yourself constantly either winning or framing in the upcoming events because you've got zero pressure and you can just fish how you want to fish. That is a peculiar one to get your head around because the difference between pleasure fishing and competition fishing is that they're, they're virtually not in the same universe yeah. for, for mental approach. And that's what it, I, I see that all the time in the car park afterwards, someone's head has gone their, their talent's there. They know what to do. They know when to do it, etc. Maybe their decision making might not be on point, but but by and large, like that, I think the pressure gets to a lot of people. You know, that is one thing I found. Do it. That's only my fourth uh, competition. Took the WPC twice and this one twice. Yeah. And just trying them out, and it's you can say to me, Andy, go and catch me a pike. Like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. But it might take all day, but I know where to go. But when you have to do it within that chunk, it's not within nine to five. You've got to do it within the, that three hours you've allocated then and there because yeah. you're going to go try, go Xander fishing then and perch fishing then. It is amazing. The pressure you put on yourself is... Well, that's, that's also where your decision-making comes in. You know, I've spoken to a few chaps in the past that have said to me, oh, I've had good day one. Then if it's a two day competition, you know, I always seem to stumble and I always say it's not your talent that's letting you down. It's your decisions, you know, and throughout the day, we're constantly com conversing. We're looking at our card. We're making strategy decisions, you know, like today, for example, we've only caught one perch. It's been 30 centimeters. So it's about a pound. But in order to try and upgrade it. There was a chance of catching, you know, Rutland's not famous for huge perch. A big perch there is maybe 41 or 42. Yeah. So we could fish for a hell of a long time trying to upgrade maybe 11 or 12 centimetres. But we've looked at our Xander and thought, we've got a 41. We could, we had a 66 last week. There's, there's 25 to be upgraded there. Yeah. You know, that sounds really basic, but a lot of people get carried away. Oh, let's just try and catch a better perch. And it's the wrong decision. You end up losing a lot of time making poor decisions like that. And I think that's where we're actually pretty pretty yeah. tuned into that, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. That's good. Um, I'll just you know, you, what you've won is very impressive. But there's one thing I do want to mention before we um, go any further, and that is getting called up to the England team. Yeah, yeah. Because that happened. I was that last October, November. 
Yeah, uh, it's been it's been a funny yeah sort of event, over winter really yeah yeah because because world championships got postponed this year as well it's in Poland it was meant to be in Poland in October and it's now been put back to Poland obviously October next year because of COVID and stuff so it's been a funny anticlimax for us really isn't it yeah I mean just massively proud and uh, and looking forward to some awesome awesome venues and and sessions and hopefully me and Tom yeah doing what we're doing, helping bring the team as high up the rankings as we can. But, yeah, great, proud, very proud to be given the opportunity, really, I suppose. So how did you... So did you know it was coming? Yeah, so the team's been um, been going for about nine years now at World Championships level, and it was certainly something that was on my mind. and, and it, On you our know, radar. We yeah. discussed it, haven't we? And, and then there was sort of new management recently-ish, and then they put up a, a thing saying, you know, put your CVs in. Um, we've got a pretty healthy CV. Um, and, yeah, we put it in and, and sort of got selected on that basis. And... Um, yeah, yeah, I can't wait it, to get started. Right? Yeah, we are. We're, we're absolutely chomping at the bit, and it, that's why it's a bit of a, you know, bit of an anticlimax with COVID this year. But, but we'll we'll be rocking and rolling for Poland next year. It's going to be tough fishing. Um, you know, the Eastern Europeans have much more of a culture of of not catch and release, shall we say, of uh, taking them for the pot. Uh, but um, yeah, so their their stock levels are lower in some of the places, but you know we can we can fish when it's hard just as much as anyone. So there's some wicked guys in the team as well, and we're learning stuff off them. Yeah. And it really feels like a good a good culture, and I hope it's a turning point as well because England hasn't traditionally got a very good record in lure angling on the world stage, but has everywhere else. Match fishing, carp fishing, ladies fly fishing. They're all pretty tidy, you know. The UK or England's got a very, very good pedigree. Yeah. You know. I think one of the things we struggle with is is the boats. You yeah. Go anywhere yeah. on the continent, they've got fantastic bass boats, big engines. There's launching facilities that are free and all these massive waters. Hence, they can have the big boats. Yeah. And you look at what we've got, and it's like, well, it's nothing. Yeah, it's <laughs> a different culture. Yeah. yeah. We generally, haven't physically got the water to no. to run anywhere near those sort of boats, and even like these events today, you know, they're all on higher boats, as as you know. But yeah, yeah I think there's going to be definitely a few eye openers when it comes to um, the talent involved in some of the other countries. It's just mind blowing, and some of the technology and the kit that they've got. You know, when we're Travelling over to these other countries, we've got to try and organise all that. But that's part of the adventure and part of the excitement and part of putting all the little bits together and making it work. Well, in the short time that I've observed what's going on, it's it was a no-brainer. I saw I saw it on Facebook and I went, yeah, that is a good choice getting you two together because it you because it you'll also inspire the other guys who have been around the scene a little while to pick up the game as well and keep going. And I think it'd be really good for the whole setup because um, I think. Uh, Everyone's got to watch their back with you two about because uh, you are. Well, we've got we've got something special, you, you know, and it. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of teams out there as well that when you know when we're having these chats with friends or in the car park at societies and stuff like that, I, I'm a, I'm aware of it. I'm aware that we have we have uh, we respect each other hugely. We know that we can cover slightly different disciplines, but at the end of the day as well, we love a beer and we're we're rock solid mates. You know, and that is the one thing that you cannot pass up is the fact that I didn't have a great day today. I've scratched out a few Xander and a few Perch, which were important. He's had an amazing day today. You know, we were on the boat together last week. I had an amazing day. Just unfortunately, it was an individuals. We were against each other. But but one of us, will, we always say to each other, we bloody made it happen again, didn't we? Yeah, we We've only gone and made happen. something happen again. Yeah. And one of us, you know, we have no qualms about like having a poor day because the other one's going to pick you up. The other one's going to carry your slack. You know, I, there's no other person in the whole of the UK that I trust as much as him to win us a competition. Well, like I see in Kev's face about 15 minutes ago when he was talking about the Xander match tomorrow, <laughs> that he'd take probably more pride in you in it than himself because he knows you've got the best chance of winning the whole thing. Yeah, yeah well, I mean... And that's I, amazing. Yeah, that's... We can't fish as a team. So, again, like, you know, we had an event at uh, the WPC... We had an option really in our mind where we could have 
for, for third place, but at the detriment of effect, we would have made sure we couldn't win then, you know, or it was going to become very difficult. So if we're in a position where one of us can win over both of us not winning, then obviously that's the way that I yeah. would... Yeah, but I've seen pride, the pride in your, your face was amazing. It's, like, yeah, yeah. it's a great... It's t you, you, you can't buy that, can you? It's, it's either got it or you haven't. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right, there's something I wanted to ask you both, which yeah. I wanted to do right at the beginning, and I've we've gone completely off task, because this is great, isn't it? It's, we're yeah. talking about fishing, and it, it just goes. I wanted to know how you both started fishing, because this is something I ask all the guests. So, Kev, go back... All those years, how did you get into it? Crikey, that is a few years. Um, that was when I was um, still living up in Liverpool and um, it, my mum and dad didn't really fish, but my granddad fished a little bit, but my uncle was mad keen on fishing and he just, any spare moment he had when he wasn't working, he was fishing. And so he was like, come on, Uncle Rob, I want to come with you, I want to come with you, I want to come with you. And, you know, catching again perch, most of it little tiny three, four inch perch and little tiny ropes and stuff on tiny ponds. I mean, you know, these were golf course ponds, so quarter of an acre, some of them, you know, like really, really small waters. And um, how old would you have been? Ah, oh, five, five, yeah, that sort of age, like being dragged along, you know, come yeah. on, I, I want to go, I want to go. We moved away from there and when we moved down to, to the south, um, because my parents didn't fish, my mum and dad sort of found the local fishing club and got me into there and there were some really, really good um, junior coaches back then that would pull the, all the lads together and they'd show them how to trot a stick float down the river or show them how to cast a waggler or show them how to be consistent hitting a target with a feeder and then we got into the little club matches and I think that's when my um, sort of buzz to want to win sort of started coming in. And, after a couple of successful seasons and winning most of the junior sections, then I sort of drifted away from it, I suppose, the match scene, and got myself into stalking barbel and, you know, walking for miles and miles and miles just after one or two fish, generally on my own, or maybe with a good mate. Um, but, you know, we, again, we put the time and the hours in, and once we started sort of seeing a decline in the barbel on the small rivers we were fishing through poaching and otters and stuff and getting repeat captures I sort of drifted away from it a bit then and that's um, when children come into my life and uh, <laughs> my fishing time sort of starts to dwindle a bit then you know and that's that's how I sort of stumbled upon lure fishing. Um, a friend said to me, oh, do you want to come to True Valley and come out on a boat and I said Phew. Why do I really want to go and chuck bits of plastic and stuff about all day when I can go and stalk a barbel or something? And bought a few bits and bobs. I think I had one small pike that session, six or seven pound, but that was it. I mean, mm, yeah. when that, that pike hit that lure, that's, it's not like watching a float go under or watching a quiver tip move a bit. Any movement, and like what we're learning now, some of the bites today is just a tiny little touch not a rod wrencher but when you get a good bang there's just do you think you can counter strike in your sleep oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. that's what i'll say to my yeah. boat partner today yeah, without but, doubt. but zorro I think yeah this without doubt. the tug is the drug though <laughs> the isn't tug it is the drug and yeah i mean that's where it's then brought me into you know the last sort of six or seven years is when i've been lure fishing and really seriously sort of in the last certainly four or five years um but i just love it but we've gone the whole opposite way now i mean Going out in these waters isn't, oh, let's just take a lure rod and a little <laughs> bag and a little net and a couple of little bits. It's, <laughs> How much gear can you get in a boat? Well, as I think you've already mentioned, <laughs> you see the state of mine in Tom's boat, and generally my end is a lot worse. There is kit everywhere. And it doesn't matter whether we've had a brilliant day, so it's chaotic because of that, or whether we've had a bad day and it's chaotic because you've gone through everything in your bag, in your box. But um, It's but always yeah. chaotic. <laughs> I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't really see myself doing anything else. Fishing, working and family, that's that's me, really. It's, this lure, I, I, lure fishing is addictive, it's, it's the sensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a thing, isn't it? And the, yeah. yeah. And because the gear's getting... Um, more finesse, isn't it? The braid's getting thinner and it's the rods are getting lighter and yeah. the reels are just amazing. The whole thing is the sensation just goes through the roof. It's all so comfortable, designed to be comfortable yeah. to use for long periods of time and for all day and stuff. But yeah, some of the little dinks you get and 
myself and Tom today we were fishing around a bream shoal and you know it because you can feel the line yes. coming over their fins yeah. or over the back or the tail and with some of these bigger pike rods and heavy braid and sets, that type of setup you can't feel those details that are giving you information all the time. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, all the finesse stuff definitely yeah, gives cool. you a lot of information back. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mr Hunt. Yeah, on, so... your background. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I started fishing when I was probably five or six with my dad down the local canal, like a lot of people start off. Yeah, uh, small perch and maggots and stuff like that. Uh, joined a club and, and like Kev, got into some junior matches, did quite well. And I, I think that's actually really important, you know, to to taste some of that competitive kind of vibe. Uh, and also when you're a kid, like trying to manage your emotions, I, I remember having a couple of absolute disaster matches and I was so frustrated and I, I almost felt sick on the way home thinking, oh, I've ruined it and I've, I hate fishing. And, you know, and then, and then maybe a couple of weeks later, you get like a third place or something on the dune and you're just over the moon. You caught a few crusions and a tench and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's all of those little bits. And then, um, and then, yeah, I, I got drafted. I won quite a few uh, junior competitions. I got drafted in for a winter league into the adult team in the Avon Valley uh, a winter league. Uh, first time I fished, I won my section. Uh, I was like 15 years old and, and that was amazing. And then, yeah, went through the whole kind of like, yeah, adult team fishing and, and fishing nationals. You know, I just loved those huge events. You know, like some of them are... I guess there were probably upwards of 400 anglers sometimes, you know, it was, uh, might have even been more than that sometimes. But yeah, I've got a Division 2 silver medal. That was amazing on the Stainforth and Keedby Canal. You know, so we, we used to travel and, and all of that match fishing. And then similarly went to, um, went to university down in Plymouth on the coast, got into a little bit of... Um, Look, got into a little bit of sea fishing and stuff like that. And, that, and that's when I started getting into my bass fishing, uh, saltwater bass and wrasse and stuff like that down by the coast. And that was, that was great. And that kind of led me a little bit more into the freshwater side. But again, you know, like Kev said, it's, it's just once you're, once you've, it's almost like a non-return thing. I think once, you, you know, this, uh, the thing that I found fascinating is, Every single time you get a bite, it's like you've never had a bite before. Yeah. Uh, and and the amount to learn is just incredible. That's what really keeps us hungry. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's so many people getting into the lure fishing scene now. Everything from so accessible, one rod, reel. You know, you can have a full setup for less than 100 quid. Go down to your local canal uh, and watch a couple of YouTube videos and you're into it. And it's and it's absolutely cracking fun straight away. All the way through up to, you know, some of the fish that you got. I mean, Andy, you had a £25 pike oh, today. You've had a 23 <laughs> You know, like I'm these are you, magnificent I'm glad you fish. that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, they are. They're magnificent fish. You have them in front of you on the boat. And they are what most people would call monsters. Yeah. You know, um, and there's a there's a whole ton in between. Do you not also think it's part of the fact that you've it's so physical? That yeah. You, you can't fluke these fish out. You, you might, in a season, you might get a fluke fish, but to consistently catch these fish, you, 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 you have, you're doing it yourself, aren't you? Yeah, it's the, the consistency is, being consistent is the key to, to the competition fishing. Yeah. And the only way you'll get consistent is practice, 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 and just keep learning. And the more you learn, yeah, you know, the easier it is next time. Well, supposedly it's not always easier, no. but um, I mean, it's no. it does surprise me though that like so um, the guys Andy and Alan who who came second today, um, very consistent. We won Zander Cup last year. They were second. Uh, Alan won WPC on the kayaks this year. They're always there They're or thereabouts. They're about very very good. English, yeah. But but. When it comes down to it, their pike fishing isn't very good. And they, they've said to me today in the car park, you know, I said, man, pike are absolutely key today, as they were last week at Pike Maniacs. And they know that that is a chink in their armour. They're very good competition anglers. They're very good at, at zander fishing and perch fishing. But today, we were favourites today. I wasn't expecting a win because you never can. But 
it didn't surprise me when we did win because I know that we have got a quality all round setup. Fish, you know, the pair of us, we're more than happy to pick up a perch rod, fish on a crankbait, fish on a drop shot, do whatever. Once we catch what we need to catch, we can then put that down and with equal amounts of confidence, change our game plan completely on its head and go and fish for 20 pound pike you know, which we then can do as well. And there's not that many people that I think that have got that kind of strength in depth. And that's what kind of keeps us up there at the moment. So well, that's where these multi-species competitions as well, they yeah. just bring, you have to be on your A game to one, catch all three species in the time allowed and the biggest possible. And yeah. some days it's nearly impossible just to catch one species, let yeah. alone all three. <laughs> well, if anyone listening to this thinks that what Tom said a minute ago was, Big headed. Let me just tell you a little tale, and I'll put this in the context. So I've had this. I've had two nice fish today. When I had the second one, it's 105 centimeters. So me and my boat partner, we just went. Let's just get a perch and a zander, and we have won this. And got back in. And I saw Tom first and asked him what he got. And my little inside of me, I went. Mm. <laughs> and, and then I stood. Sorry. Next, no. I stood next to my boat partner, and I said, "The." And, if you want to blush, it's fine. I said, these guys are amazing. I said, we were out there and we were, if we'd have got a Xander, we would have been convinced we would have thrashed everybody because there's not every day you get a fish like that in a competition. But I said, they've not caught one longer than mine. They've caught two. <laughs> and I said, and that shows how good you two are because I thought for, for an hour or two, I thought I've got a chance of this today. Yeah. Yet when I come in, I didn't have a chance of it because you still had two longer fish and you had... The bigger perch. Us, we were. We had a little perch. You were ten centimeters ahead of us. We needed. A, we needed a big zander. But you. You were there as well last year. You had a meter long pike last year. Yeah, but. But yeah. but that just obviously shows, and that's kind of yeah. the point I just yeah. made. It's, Your it's, pike fishing is very strong. Yeah. You know, but then rest, when it, it comes yeah. down to the other stuff, like the conversation we had on the phone about after WPC about the perch fishing, you know, we were chatting away on the phone for I don't know, probably an hour and a half. Oh, at least. Yeah. But yeah. but you were keen, and and like I already know that you'll get there with all of the other species, but it just takes time, and you have to focus on it and commit. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and I think that shows how what level you two are at because it's I'm not being big headed but I, I know what I'm doing with pike yeah. but when I'm looking from the outside in it's amazing because you guys if we go pike fishing you'll, you'll match me and, and beat me but if we go perch fishing Xander fishing I'm okay say I'm graphing with Xander at times yeah. but again I've got no chance and I think that's just I'm just looking thinking wow you, you've got such a wealth of knowledge and expertise in these different species on different venues with different techniques and you both do something slightly different it is amazing I find it amazing watching from the outside in it is quite an eye opener and I go away thinking I've got so much to learn I know <laughs> and that's that's the kind of frustrating thing but kind of cool no, it's, thing it's at the, the same cool time thing. it is yeah. the cool thing there's two things I want to mention because our, our time's going on and yeah got things pub's calling yeah. yeah time for a beer I think one thing that's really really important is that you two and I have as well we have such supportive partners and family units yeah because yeah. you couldn't do this without the support from that because it's just it, that that's part of the team isn't it Oh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. My first phone call was to my wife and little girl, you know, and the, her, my little Isabel, her first question was, Daddy, did you and Tom win today? Yeah. <laughs> and then you'd obviously take great pride in saying yes. And then her second question, which it generally is, is, did you catch a big pike today? <laughs> yes, yes. yes, I caught two or three. Yes. <laughs> it was brilliant. And, you know, my wife's at home, we've got a disabled little boy, but she's at home with our little boy and looking after Isabel on her own. And I'm... Um, sat in a hotel room talking about fishing. Yeah. Having been fishing all day, you yeah. know, and luckily I'm allowed to go fishing all day again tomorrow. Yeah. So, yeah, without the support of friends and family as well. Yeah, yeah. and that's something I keep reminding myself. It's, we're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh, God. I mean, I mean, especially, you know, the support from, yeah, I mean, family, same, same thing here. Like, my wife called back just before we got in the room because I was trying to, you know, she's the first person I want to tell. She always wants to know, how did I do, all that sort of stuff. And it's, you know, it makes you quite proud, you know, when you can call your family yeah. and say you've done well. Because they do, they support you and they give up stuff. Like, we've got four chickens, two dogs <laughs> and a cat that she's got to look after all weekend so she can't go anywhere while I come fishing. 
But, you know, it's also uh, from our sponsorship roles. We're just incredibly fortunate that, yeah. you know, we've got we've got tackle companies that support us really heavily, um, uh, you know, and can support us with everything through from travel costs to contacts to, you know, I mean, you've done some amazing catfish fishing yeah, in France and just, yeah. the opportunities out there are insane, you know, so like it. You know, no man's an island. It's not. It's not even just us two. There's there's a wealth of people behind you that yeah. uh, allow you to get to this position. So, and but especially yeah. because even though it sounds like yes, we're out there winning competitions and stuff, we're not winning any money. We're not paying any bills from doing it. You know, so yeah. it's not like we can say to our wife, "So yeah, we've won and we're giving you a nice fat <laughs> check." And, you know, maybe one day it's not American bass to, fishing. Yeah, so, you know, we're getting this support spending the money yeah. and yeah not really bringing a great deal yeah. home so if, perhaps just stop and get a bunch of flowers and listen when I get you both on individually later on the year because you both um, got your own businesses as well yeah so I mean we won't touch that now yeah we, we haven't got time or the, probably the energy or the uh, <laughs> yeah the eyelids sort of closing but it's it's balancing everything which is crucial right last thing guys before we go we could talk all night, couldn't we? Because yeah, it's fishing. Easy. <laughs> and once we start, it's just amazing, isn't it? And I think this is what we're finally doing the podcast, is whenever we have people on, it's just lovely to talk about fishing. And it doesn't matter what uh, discipline we're talking about. Everyone's got the similar kind of background, and we love catching fish and looking after our sport and the environment and sharing it. So thank you very much for this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, yeah. it's been a ball. Yeah, it's been brilliant. And... Uh, I will be harassing you later on the year. I want to hear all about the um, the Xander Cup tomorrow. Xander Cup yeah. tomorrow, and, and yeah. Is it next week on Grafham? Uh, no, I think no, it's, it's a couple of weeks, yeah, it skips it? a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple of competitions on Grafham. So. Yeah, we've got yeah. Perch Mania, which yeah. we should be up for this year as well. So if we have a catch-up, kind of, I'll be sort of Christmas probably. And yeah, see how you go on. Yeah. Yeah, and I can tell you about my um, perch escapades. <laughs> we'll have you a free four four pounder in no time, Andy. Yeah, no time at all. I know. I should enjoy it. Should Not I? on a pike rod, I mean. Yeah, you've oh, probably yeah. had them that <laughs> big before, but winding them in on a pike rod ain't counting. Yeah, flute catches. Oh, that would do. Three to four in rod and let it crack on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be cool. Oh, guys, I really appreciate your time because uh, you've you've fitted me in, and we've uh, we're all very tired, but it's been brilliant. Thank you for talking to me. Thanks no very much. Thanks very much. Okay, so that was Kevin Tom, and I'm going to stop talking about them now because it sounds like I've got a bit of a bromance thing going on. Alex has been taking the mick out. friends. <laughs> Ooh, lure friends. Alex has been uh, taking the mick out of me as we've been listening to that. Right, um, I am going to get them on separately later on the year because they are just two good individual anglers not to pick their brains. Okay, now I'm going to pass this back to Alex. So... From a lure match competition fishing scene, let's go back to maggot drowning. Right. Uh, I would say blood worm, but you don't use blood worms so maggot drowning. I like yeah. the way you, when people come in the shop and say, can I have big maggots? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> big maggots? It's yeah. like... Yeah, well, there's maggots. squats and pinkies, isn't there? Well, surely they're small and maggots are normal. No, it's just... It's just fishing talk, isn't it? Fishing Big slang. Big Yeah. Pinky's tiddly and a squat is like, really? Yeah, well, they all have their place, like your lures and do different you, colours. Do you different use a lines. squat on the hook? Yeah. No way? Yeah. What are you trying to catch? You tend to, it's like anything. With bloodworm fishing, you fish a joker on the hook, you can probably catch the biggest roach in your peg. Guys fishing for tig goat might need <laughs> 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 we'll come on to that later. Yeah, you have to have fish there to catch. Yeah, yeah. stickleback bashing. Yeah, oh, there's an art to that. You laugh, there's an art to catch stickleback. I know, you, stickle you bored me about this story once. Yeah, well, well you know. We'll go into it again in a minute. Team fishing is team fishing. <clears throat> right, before I get on, I, I, something else has cropped into my head, and well, I want to say this, it was great to see your granddad at the tackle shop. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. So, Sid, as he's known. Sales prevention officer. <laughs> <laughs> he tried oh. to charge me double on yeah. Friday. <laughs> Yeah. Getting his own back. Oh, he's learning, isn't he? He ain't lost his touch, has he? No, yeah. he did it so subtly as well. Wow. He's good, isn't he? I sat there thinking, 75 quid? <laughs> what, for two pints of maggots? And a bank stick. <laughs> a couple of bank sticks, yeah. a couple of pole rigs. And the a... charges for the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, joking apart, it was great to see him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, cool. Right, here's my little question to you then. So, managing Daiwa Tackle and Bates, mm. what do you focus on from your team perspective as you go into a match preparation-wise? Well... Obviously, we know the venue reasonably well because we've fished this, you know, we're all fairly local lads and we sort of know the venues, not inside out because they change every year. It's just little subtle changes. You know, it, it might be fishing the same this year as it did maybe two or three years ago. And um, the key thing in any sort of fishing really is feeding, presentation and location. It's the same in any fish, you know, any aspects of fishing. So... You can have the best rigs, the best bait, but if it's in the wrong location, you're not going to do well. So you need to, all those three things need to be right. Um, do I need to confiscate your phone? No, oh. just says something about lockdown changes that are new in England. Not that we've seen it on every single channel today. Um, so yeah, I mean, fishing the drains around here, we, the first thing is, obviously the venue, so March is slightly different from Benick and Benick's slightly different from Factory Bank and there, there's certain methods that work there that don't on others, but sometimes something that works at Benick might be working at March, like something that we do similarly. Um, so can you give me an example without giving away any trade secrets? Well, it's feeding, you know. Just feed, what feeding rates? What makes the best anglers what they are is what they what they feed. Right. You know, but some days you need loads of food, some days you need no food, and it's all about assessing the venue, how it's fishing. Will you phone each other up during the match? Um, sometimes, I mean, there's critical little things. You know, I think I've said before, if there's a tench, if someone's got a tench, the chances are they have a little window where they feed. So sometimes it's it's good just right. to put. I've caught a tench or. Bob Smith next to me has caught a tench. Do you know what I mean? And it, sometimes it might so, come out. So do you have a group chat? Yeah, oh yeah, we've got a group so chat. So while the match is going on, someone might just Some text people, tench. Normally it's when it's at March, it's taking pictures of people sat opposite and fishing. Um, or uh, or <laughs> boats going through her and look at this nice fella on the far bank or something like that. But yeah, it's um it sometimes it's handy. And as, as some long little as the information kid, is good. Some little kid yesterday, he's about yeah. ten, yeah. started hurling abuse at me across really? the river. Yeah. yeah. Never what did seen... he say? He called me a flicker. A flicker? Yeah. Not a fluff checker. <laughs> no. no. I thought, what is he doing? Wow. He think he was showing up in front of his mate. So I did tell him to stay put yeah. while I walked over the bridge and threw him in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of abuse on the chat as well. Don't get me wrong, yeah. Um, but during the match, do you actually communicate via uh, phones? Not or? very often. Sometimes, um, if you're catching, you just, you just get your head down and yeah. you've got time for on your phone, to be honest. But um, before and after, definitely. So beforehand, so for example, um, Benick, yeah. would you have all have had had a chat about what lines to, to, yeah. to fish? Yeah, so we would all sort of, we roughly know how to fish Benick. Everyone fishes in their own style, so you, you're not going to get a team that everyone fishes exactly the same. In every team, everyone has different, you know, the same with football, everyone has their own styles in the team, and as long as the result's good at the end of it, that's all that matters. You know, you, like you were saying about old mate with the rough boat, um, you can have all the gear but no idea, but it's all about what goes on the scales at the end of the day. You know, oh, the boat wasn't rough, it was just full of water. Oh, and right. it, it was like, there was lures everywhere. They had yeah, well, worked so hard in the match. Everyone's, you know, you yeah. look at some anglers and they're neat, tidy, everything's all regimental and yeah. stuff like that. And there's other anglers that are just natural and they're just, there's top kits everywhere, there's ground bait everywhere. There's a lot of bombs gone off, but in their head they know exactly where everything is and they can just yeah. pick it up and do yeah. it. Yeah. And everyone has their own styles, but... Um, so let's go back to so that yeah. then. Would you have like so as a team you're gonna talk about what lines you're gonna approach? Yeah, roughly roughly 
areas in your peg, normally like Benick, you have sort of fish down the middle to start off with and the fish move across and right, yeah. stuff like that and everyone sort of bounces off each other, I found this, this, this was better, yeah, and that was definitely right, that was wrong, that weren't right in this area because of this and, yeah. you know, different so sections what, of the drain so fish baits? differently. Yeah, ground baits? When you, yeah, when you have baits. like a team ground bait? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, some teams have the same mix and they all stick to that mix, but like I was saying, everyone fishes slightly different. Um, and as long as you know what the ground bait is doing, I suppose, or whether you need ground bait or not, or how much ground bait, how much bait to put in your ground bait, so like pinkies, squats, or what you're putting in, um, that's that's key little things. So within, the, t- within the team, there'll be, a, there'll be space for the individual to... Um, adapt within the over, over the match as it starts and to do what their own thing once they've got going yeah oh yeah yeah I mean it's um, obviously a lot of it's down to the angle of fishing and, and how they fit which yeah. is you know but it's not like someone's on a walkie talkie going right yeah you can top up now or do this or do that they're not robots that they they do their own naturally what they would do if they were fishing I'm at the end, when we finish recording, remind me to tell you a tale about something right. where this did not happen. Right. Yeah. Um, obviously, rigs as well. Different presentations, catch different stamped fish. Some venues, it's all about just catching fish and putting them in your net. And some venues, like March, you can be a bit more selective. Um, you can be more aggressive with your feeding or, you know... it. it it changes all the time and that's where you know you can have all the gear but if you're not on it as we say res- responding to how the river's fishing or drain canal lake wherever you're going then it's pointless really yeah yeah that's i think that makes sense perfect and when when all the teams and everyone's at such a high standard one little thing can make a big yeah. difference massive so and that's why you have the practice matches before oh, yeah, I mean, yeah sometimes a pra- practice is good because you get to see the whole length and match conditions there's nothing like actual match conditions no um, I mean we've had a couple of lineups now and we've gone in the week and caught loads of fish even though there's like eight of us all in a row in matchish conditions but it's the angling pressure of 80 anglers there and cars and people sort of waiting and starting at the same time and Little things like that, so there's a, there's a difference. Oh, it's amazing. The fish know, don't they? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. They do know. Yeah. No matter what venue you're on, uh, human human pressure makes a difference to them. Oh, that's cool. I think it'd be quite cool to have a um, podcast just on team tactics and how you go about it. I think it'd be quite interesting. Mm. It would, I think, without giving away any mm. team secrets, uh, we're going to delve deep. Right. Shall we start with the match results? Yeah. Yeah. So might as well start with Ramsey, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah, so their midweek sweepstakes, as they call them, have started. They're not on um, St Mary's yet. I think it's still too weedy, still a bit too early. I don't think the fish have quite migrated in there yet. Um, it's a funny time of year, this time of year, for the drains. I think it basically sums them up in a nutshell this time of year. It's, you know, you can be going to one bridge... And catch a fishy chuck one day and then you tell someone to go there the next day and they blank it's it's that frustrating sometimes the drain so you need the weather to either get cold quickly and the fish settle where they want to settle or we just have to roll the dice and hope that there's a few fish about which um obviously ramsey have found the fish at the narrows um, which is is a good stretch really for pike and for for match anglers alike but um, there's always been a lot of tension this year there seems to be a few more tension about maybe it's you know maybe it's a year of big fish but we shall see first overall was John Locke 15-12 from the MPEG-1 he had a tension a few perch and bits and bobs and a few rud which you see quite a lot on the drains this time of year runner up was Kevin Medlock um, good to see him fishing again uh, I know he had a little while where he didn't fish and he had £11.8 Third was Ivan Steele's, £11.6, and fourth was Ken Taylor with £11.2. So, oh, that tight consistent, match, yeah. Consistent yeah, weight. Tight match. And Sunday they went back again. 
Um, Ivan Steels, £11.3. Fern Edgley, the Ramsey Bailiff, ten twelve. Stu che Cheatham was third with £7.11. So, respectable weights, you know. Um, so that was the Ramsey. Then you had the Whittlesea Winter Series started Saturday and it's good to see the numbers going up and up every year. Um, they're a brilliant club, lovely, friendly club. And they were on what we call um, Wilsey Dyke or the Bower. Not the Bower, Wilsey Dyke or Queen's Way it's called. Um, at the back of the industrial estate there through to the Ashline Sluice. Um, Andy Lawrence was top dog there with £9.2. Jeff Tuttleby was second. He was the other side of the railway bridge. So he was top weight that side with £7.3. And then Chris Hardman had 5.14 on the disabled pegs as well. So, I mean, I don't know really what time of year the fish get in there, but Whittlesey Dart used to be a brilliant little venue in the winter. Is Always that flowing. as you go from Whittlesey to Peterborough and you go over a bridge and it's to your right and it goes to a sluice gate? Mm, no, you're thinking of um, Kingston. Kings yeah. yeah. So it's the opposite end. So Whittlesey Dyke is basically the start of the old knee. Ah, uh, Angle yeah. Bridge? Uh, that's a bit further down. So it's before that. So where it comes through Kings Dyke, runs at the back of Whittlesey, past the scrapyard, goes into like a, a real channel tunnel and it's literally a 90 degree bend at the back of the manor leisure at Whittlesey. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally is a 90 degree bend to get round. Certain boats can't get through if they're too big. It's unbelievable. In the summer that is absolutely full of chub. I think that's Yaxley yes. water. Yes, uh, it's very streamy isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, there's a lot of sort of skimmers, some nice roach. It's more canal looking up there but there's some big chub and Cool. There's, a, there's not just a few there's a lot in there it's surprising how many is in there and then it goes to like Ashline Sluice then below that is what they call Whittlesey Dykes that's where the Whittlesey water starts oh, I got you and then it goes bends round underneath the railway bridge goes at the back of Carpet City which I think they call Queen's Way um, then it goes to Angle Bridge and then obviously Cop Bank and then yeah. Cop Bank goes into the old Neen at Stafford's Bridge Straight through March. Yeah, I got you. So the natural flow is through there. Yeah. Through Cop Bank, Stafford's Bridge, and March, all the way through. So we had sort of three or four years where that fishing was unreal, and you'd catch all the way through there from Peg One right up to as far as you can go. Um, brilliant fishing, you know, twelve, fourteen pound, a nice little dumpy roach. But the last few years, it's not been as prolific. But you know, fish move, don't they? Get trapped in or whatever. Get eaten. Yeah, get eaten. Um, and then new sort of venue really that's just sort of not really appeared but more sort of been highlighted is the Serpentine Lakes. Mm, I saw the match result. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's gaining a reputation quite fast, and I don't know too much about it. I know there's quite a few little lakes in Hampton. Um, I remember one day I come across the sunset one right near the pub in Hampton and you looked at it and I thought, God, that's like quite a little lake. And then I sort of look around the corner and it's sort of two lakes and there's people fishing. It's, it's full of skimmers. A lot of these lakes are all interlinked, so the fish can move across them, I think. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the match weights. They've been having one a month. Um, and it's not dominated by bream. Um, it's tench, the, the tench and rud, you know, so it looks a bit different. Yes, you know? yeah. There's not platforms, you have to wade out into the water and get sort of settled in and you can catch sort of 40, 50 pound of rud. Because uh, I saw Andy Shortland and his, ma That's and it? his mate yeah. fish yeah. it last month and put it on their their Facebook page and did he not organise the match this week? Yeah, I think it was cast as a Dye River Fen Angler Open. That's it, yeah. Um and top three all, all come in the shop this weekend and bought bait, so um, obviously it works. What, well, big maggot? Big big red maggot. Oh, big. Big red big maggot. Big red maggot. Yeah. Anyway, so out in front was Paul Kilby. He's never seen the lake before, never fished it before. He had £51.2, um, and that included two tench and a load of rud. So 
a That's lot a lovely of, day. A fishing. lot of rod. A lot of rod, yeah. But his brother had more rod. Yeah, his brother had 47.8, which was oh. all rod. <laughs> That's so, mad. It is, yeah. I, I've spoke to a few people that have fished it a little bit sort of through the autumn, and um, they reckon 60, 70 pound of rod's quite doable, which is... What, are they half pound jobs? Some of them are, but I think there's there's a mixture of sizes. Um, odd roach in there. And then third was Tom Winter with 43.11. He had eight tench. You know, you know, that's a lovely day's fishing. But I think as it gets colder, the rud tend to move away from the main part of the but lake. the backup weights were up there as well. Yeah, they? loads of 30s. Yeah, four, yeah, I know. It wasn't like three big weights. No. It sounded like a fantastic, uh, a fantastic match that they organised yeah. there. And I think the club is... It's a it's a club lake as well, so um, it gets looked after well. Yeah, that sounds something different, not too far away. Yeah, and uh, we're going to have Andy Shortland on as a guest. Oh, brilliant! At some point. Yeah. When um, I get my brain in gear and get a bit more organised, so Good. yeah, I messaged him a couple of weeks ago, so that'd be interesting because I know him and his buddy they do a lot of uh, silverfish fishing, don't mm-hmm. they? And they put it on their Facebook yeah. page, and that's really interesting to see how they get on. So that would be nice to have him on. And he's also an ambassador for the Fenland Guardian yeah, scheme. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. But that match was a really good idea, and the weights are special, so that was cool. What else have you got? Well, the last one, I think, just basically what we say about the fence. Um, a venue that we both know very well. Um, and this time of year, Tid has always been in our winter league. Um, Tid go at North Level, yeah. and the last three or four years, picking a venue for this round has always been difficult because the fish are always migrating here, there, and everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if people can hear some really strange noises. It was Alex's envelope five minutes ago. You just pinged something on the microphone. I don't know what you did. It made a lovely little uh, guitar ding. sound. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so TID was a venue we used for the second round quite a lot. And then each year it's, it got harder to find the fish. You know, I think the last two years at TID, the fish have stayed at Main Road as such. Um, but the, the TID club always moved down the drain with the fish. Normally Main Road going back down, right down to French Drove and slowly moving with them. And the weights were always really, really good. Um so obviously seeing the match results the last two or three weeks they've tried two or three different venues all being at that end of the of the drain. Um so it was sad to see that half ounce won the match on Sunday. Um Yeah, there's a guy who's won his first match. So have you got we need Steve to, Fox. Yeah, well yeah. done. We need to mention him for doing that as well. Yeah, done. well done. A yeah. win's a win. Yeah, that's... Maybe you win with £100 or half exactly, pounds, a win's yeah. a win. That was really good. And one other guy weighed in as, I think, a stickleback. Yeah. And that was it. I'm a bit concerned about North Level. I don't know. I, you know, we, we people will get privy to what we're talking about right now because we're going to get into it. Last year, there were a lot of cormorants on there January onwards. Right. Like, if I said 10 a day, that would be a very pessimistic count. Mm. And if they eat £2 a fish a day on average, that's £20 a fish a day. If you just say they're on there for two months, what's that? That's eight weeks, two eights. I don't do my maths. £20. You're a math teacher. Yeah, apparently. Uh, (laughs) £20 a fish a day. If that's seven days a week, that's £140 a week. Yeah. Times that by eight. What we've got eight hundred for eight six and forty two. That's nine hundred and twenty. Is that right? No. Eight nine ten. Twelve hundred and twenty pounds of fish in two months. Mm. Those cormorants didn't go there to have a swim, did they? No. And North Level match results last January were brilliant. I think Pete won a match with twenty odd pound, and then suddenly it just went. Boof. The match weights dropped off, dropped off, dropped yeah. off. Now, I know the guys at the club think the bigger roach moved off with the rud, but I don't know. I, see, I think because the water level was run so low last year, a lot of those fish got pushed into main road, and I think it just was open season for the cormorants because they had nowhere else to go. I hope I'm wrong, 
Mm. Because they are catching a few roach, black dyke, and some nice ones by the looks of things. But I wonder if the fish are taking a refuge there because it's shallow and reedy and they can hide from the predators. Uh, yeah, I think the fish are just... All the fish are moving. I mean, you've seen it here uh, in the old Neen that the amount of fish that are moving in. You know, we could go to Copolder on Sunday at Benick and there'd be no fish there, but I still think it's warm enough for a few fish to be out of the towns and you know and daylight is is the main is the main thing i think with with these fish um i got reason... my math slightly wrong no it's 1120 pounds oh, okay yeah yeah but it's there that i don't know alex i just for that to that many cormorants to get pulled into that small stretch for so long mm. they are there for one reason one reason only and that's to have a feed and i don't know it's it's a bit sad really and like i said i hope i'm really wrong I know, I was looking back at the match results, in early September they were catching silverfish on Main Road. Yeah. Not a lot, but I think four There's all five sorts pounds. of things. All, couldn't, it can be to do with the tides, you know, there might be the, the salt obviously comes up yep. and can go through the ground and stop the fish feeding. There's all sorts of things. Well, you're right what you said. Tid always had the migration of fish. They used to move upstream pretty quick come the colder months. Yeah. Harold's Bridge was really good for quite some time. New Cut. New it used to be, about this time of year, it'd be Black Dyke. Yeah. Then it'd be New Cut, Harold's. And then Clough, obviously, when and it then, had a bit more depth And then to Clough it. for majority of the year. Yeah. And then French Drove or Swan. Yeah. After Christmas. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, that's what's happened. We'll find out, because the guys will work out where to I go. I mean, the other thing is as well, they had the the pollution problems at Cloud Bridge two or three years ago. Maybe the fish didn't go down there because of that and they held up at... Um, I'm mean, just, just thinking out loud. Didn't then they held a few fish up at Main Road. Maybe now that Cloud's back to normal how it should be, the fish are going to migrate back up there. You just don't know, do you? you they know? always did every year. Yes. Uh, since I was fishing, so that's a long time. Mm. They always used to go up Clough, Swan, Throckenall. Yeah. Yeah. But we will see. But they, it was amazing. Every time I drove over it, going to other places, I just used to have a stop and have a look. And the number of cormorants on there last winter was ridiculous. Mm. And I think I think in general there was a lot of cormorants everywhere inland because of the amount of rain. I think the rivers were all so powerful and stuff like that. I think that they just all flocked to lakes and... All the drains and the slower sluggish venues, to be honest. There was a bird count on Rutland Water three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. 1,200 cormorants. Really? Yeah. They were expecting 800, which is a lot. There was 1,200. And that's a very accurate count because they do it um, through the um, the twitches and the bird hides. Yeah. So that's a bit scary, really. And these cormorants are... Bad news. They just uh, they find where the fish are real quick and just empty places, don't they? Anyway, I hope I'm really wrong. I hope Tid Goat anglers find the fish next week and the week after because I'm sure, I'm sure it's will. a great little club and they have a really good turnout for the matches. So it's just a bit of a bit of a worry at the minute, but mm. time will tell. Well, you have to look at like literally just down the road. You've got the South Holland and. Eight, nine years ago, probably more than that, 12, 13 years ago, the South Holland was like it is now, producing fish, lots of roach and stuff like that. And then obviously the salt got in, killed a lot of fish, and sort of everyone avoided it for a little while. And now it's getting back to how it how it should be. And I think it's just cycles and venues change and year classes of fish die and new ones come through. and It's just nature, I think, at the end of the day. Well, that certainly happens. But when you get a lot of cormorants on the water for any extended period of time, mm. they are there for eating. Well, yeah. And they are eating machines. Yes. Yeah. But there we go. Anyway, let's um, hopefully we'll see an upturn in those results the next few weeks. Yeah. Right. The, the Benwick. Yeah, so the East Midlands win the lead practice match. Um, the draw was done on Saturday night, so everyone knew their pegs, um, which was a bit different for a lot of the anglers fishing on natural venues, it's something we've been doing. 
you still owe me 10 quid for me going down raking those swims there for you. Well, you didn't do a very good job, did you? <laughs> oh, oh, you know what it was? I didn't put the big mag in. I put you, the... you, put, you ragged the wrong peg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so yeah, so Saturday night we're near our pegs. Uh, is a prime example. I had all my kit out in the conservatory for when I got home Saturday and uh, to tie a few rigs and to go over a few things. And I come home and Dad goes, where are you drawing then? I said, oh, H5. Oh, all right. Because uh, my dad fished this week, so I need drew B, B4, which is permanent peg 12, which is good area, good area. Did he beat so you? He, sorry? Did he beat you? Uh, no, I think I beat him, actually. But... Like I was saying with the swing tip challenge, it's like oh, different areas, oh, right? Different areas. There we go. And um, he was all buzzing and keen, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna catch a load of fish." And I, I just went, "Do you know what? I can't be asked to tie any rigs tonight." <laughs> so I just packed it all away and put it in my van. And that was the downside of drawing H yeah. five. Um, but the positive, I could park behind my peg, so I didn't need my trolley. So that was good. Um, so yeah, we got there. Um, everyone's obviously social distancing. It's a bit like everyone's like from a distance. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a bit weird. Um, so yes, yeah, so we got set up. Looked at it, see a few fish moving about, and I thought, oh, I don't know, a bit a few fish here. We've been in the week and caught a few fish and at Copholder. Um, I thought oh, I think it'd be right today, and I. I was too too aggressive in my feeding. Went out a bit too much. It is an open match. It's not a team match. So you're there to try and, you know, make something happen. And um, made some big mistakes and didn't work it out till the late. And then it was too late. The fish were already backing off. And um, I mean, I had days fishing. I had eight pounds seven. I think I had. Which, That's nice, isn't it? It's is days fishing. Nice, nice little, nice little fish. My fish weren't as big as. A few of the anglers around me, and you know they've fed it differently to me. That's probably why they've caught a bigger stamp. But um, it, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but I don't know. The venue was a bit up and down. Um, you have to see by the weights. You get like a few sixes, and all of a sudden there's like a twelve pound, and then there's a few fives and sixes, and there's a couple of pegs with a seven and an eight. And is then it histo- fours. is it historically peggy, or is it just? Like um, it it's a strange venue. Uh, as a team venue, it's 80 pegs in a row and you think it'll be really fair. But the f- there's more fish in certain areas, so you've got to be the right ends of sections or avoiding... Normally, C-section is the dodgy one, and I think it could be this weekend. But C-section was where Mark Pollard won the match from, and it never normally wins. If it does, it'll be with big fish. But there's a set of wires that go across, and basically there's um, a big gap. So depending on how many teams are in the league, you have more pegs one side than the other. Um, one side is normally full of little blips and Im- immature little fish that weigh like 30 to the pound, and the other side is, is just off the what we call little London, the boats, and it's normally stampier fish. They'll probably catch 12 pounds, 10s, 12s, and the other side will catch 6s and 7s, unless they catch some tench and that could be the difference between the team winning and team coming fourth on the day in our league because if two teams draw in that half of the section, they're on ones and twos and then the rest of them you're fishing for best of the rest and um, it's always been the same at Bennett. That little bit there does decide who comes in what order in, in the team stakes. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be exceptionally close again this week. Um, the teams, everyone seems up for it again. You know, the, the, each year that it gets even more competitive, and teams have new anglers to improve them, and more anglers are going practicing the week now, and it's um, awesome, really. Because yeah. I don't think yeah. there's a league that does puts that sort of effort in. You know, with the teams, and uh, the banter's good, and and stuff like that, which is is a shame about can't going back to the pub afterwards and. You know, cheering on the results and booze and you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a good laugh. It is. It's all. Well, you we know. went to the March Open last year, didn't we? I took the microphone, yeah. and it was yeah, it was really nice atmosphere. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is. It is. That's what yeah. a lot of anglers go natural venue fishing for because of that that atmosphere afterwards and before. Um, but yeah, it was it fished okay. Um, 
I think it will maybe fish a bit better this week. We've never really been this early to Benick. Normally we're there in a couple of weeks' time, so there's a bit more fish migrated in as such. Um, but basically, Polly won the match again. So he won the round last week and won the match this week. Didn't he not win a match the week before that as well? Yeah, I think he won the big Willerton final. He had some chub. <laughs> Um, he is on fire, like you he said. He, once he gets on a roll, that's it. Yeah, he goes on these little winning streaks, and um, he's, he's unstoppable. Um, so he had nineteen thirteen, and he's had he's had a tench on his pinky rig, and then he's had like fourteen, fifteen pound of roach to go with it. So he's had a lovely day's fishing, yeah. and from that area as well. I mean, normally seven pounds is like what you're looking for with these little tiny little immature fish and he's caught some roach so it just goes to show it there's just little pockets of these roach in areas and um hope you got a draw on them next week runner up was kai durham on peg six a6 which is opposite the willow tree um it's a good peg he's a good peg i drew it a couple of times last year and um i did okay off it i think i was second in the section and third in the hay jack or something like that anyway um i i just i don't know i just couldn't find my way with it i just caught too many small fish there and kai's obviously found some nice fish he's had 18 pound eight i'm don't, don't quote me someone said he caught a tench i don't know but if not he still had a lot of silvers for that 18 eight and then peg three simon colclough um he's had 17 two all bits and bobs I think he's had like 260 fish for £17.2, so it's been a nice stamp for Bennett. Doing a John Taylor, isn't he, Kelsey? Yeah, no, John Taylor have had 2,000 fish. <laughs> um, John Taylor's been doing one of his matches, I keep seeing on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. does. He fishes every day, I think. Um, and then he was pegged three on the boat. Fourth was Ray Malley from the M Peg at Copholder. He's had 17 one, he's had a nice day, Rudd, Roach. And a tench on the whip, so he's done well to get that out. And fifth overall was Paul Cowan with 15 6. So, so Ray Malley's back in form, is he? Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, he's one of your team members. Back on it. Yeah. Hopefully, he's going to draw a load of bungholes this week. Is he, uh, is he the I'm officially <laughs> sacked from drawing team pegs. But this happens every year. It's like, oh, you do the draw, you do the draw. I do it once, and it's like, no, someone else got to do the draw. So <laughs> it doesn't matter whether I draw or not, I still tend to. Uh, get the blame um, yeah so it was pretty standard Bennett weights to be honest the usual sort of 15 to 20 pound to frame and that is a really good 12. match stretch it, it is yeah I mean it's it's. I think this week will be a good match it'll be quite technical and be really close so, so was it just individual yes yeah, so it's just individual in the practice so there was no no, no team, team pool no. no it's just all how'd individual you do, how'd you do in your section me not very good I think I was third. Depends how you look at it. I was third in my four and third in my eight. So it's eight eight man section. So not very, not very good really. Um, Gary Miller's won my section and he's. he's you need a, to get back on form, don't you? I know. I don't know. I just haven't been on it this year so You've far. You've spent too long working. Probably, maybe. You maybe. have. You've um, yeah. been working like a dog. It's amazing how many hours you've put in. Well, I mean, I don't know. Just must, making the wrong decisions at the minute, or nice not making your, them quick it enough. It must be I nice think. in your tackle shop because you must have a lot of these guys come in talking about the winter league. Oh yeah. So it must yeah. be. Yeah. You yeah. like the the nerve centre of it all. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, yeah. All the banter and wind up. Yeah, and, it's good. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, it's competitive and and at the same time it's banter as well. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the whole thing through is sports, isn't it? It's the yeah. the camaraderie and the. Uh, the, the banter that goes with it, the wind-ups and uh, the leg pulling. Mm. And also, people, the person they've taken the mickey out of, when they have come around and have a big win, everyone also then uh, says well done as well. So yes. it's, it's all really good. Right, so, as a team, did you learn a lot? Um, there's a few things. We went in the week and thought that, you know, worked out what cop holder was going to be all about and that fish completely different to how it was in the week. Like chalk and cheese different. Um, I don't know really. We've just got to get a nice set of pegs that we're confident with and just fish well and put fish on the scales and see what happens. You know, it's 
one of them. Is it going to be the same eighty anglers? Uh, yeah, there, there, it'll be a, there'll be different. There'll be quite a lot of anglers that wasn't there, but will be there this week. And um, yeah, it the team match is totally different because in an open match, people are going there to try and win the match. Yeah. So yeah. there's more anglers fishing worms, trying to catch a bonus fish. There's yeah. more anglers trying things, hiding things for next week, working things out. <laughs> there's all sorts in the open matches, so you can't read too much into it. But then on on the other hand, you do gain a feel for how it's fishing and what areas and where you need to draw, where you need to avoid um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, they do help. Well, unless we have a horrendous downpour or some really severe frost, those fish aren't going to move for one week to no, the next. No, no, a few people are sort of saying, oh, there'll be no fish at cop holder and stuff like that and then fish go and, yeah, the fish move here, there and everywhere, but we never fish it, so... How do we know that they yeah. go? And that bait going in has got to help. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the problem is the fish that you're catching are fish that are migrating fish anyway. You know, these rud, you know, March, where do they all disappear to in March? They're all here now. Give it another two months and they they're all disappear. They're not going to go out the town stretch. They're going to be there somewhere. They well, don't they, need... They don't feed. No one catches one. Where do they go? They They've not be. been eaten by cormorants because they appear in March again. So they're not going to go out of March. Oh, well, well, because where do they go then? We just you lot aren't good enough to catch them. I've got a nine-year-old with a pen rod and uh, yeah, uh, tackle and baits rig. You can catch them. I think rudd are a very strange species they because are. yeah, they either feed and they're like piranhas, or they do not feed and they're like carp in winter they go from I think this migrating moving about eating everything on the run and then when they find where they winter they literally don't feed it's a bit like dobbing for them it's like dobbing for rudd because you don't have to feed for them they're just there yeah they are they and are if you feed they back off yeah and you fish for carp in the winter if you feed they back off and you catch them where they live so I think they're very much, they feed like carp, if you know what I mean. I can't wait for you guys to have your first match. I think it'll be good again. Oh, there's going to be some yeah. really big weights. It is stu- so. the, It is stuffed full of fish already. Yeah. It's amazing. See, I think the, I think human intervention's massive on this river, the more I learn about it. Yeah. Guys that live on the boats, people that walk over bridges, they're constantly chucking in bread. Yeah. It is amazing. I mean, they've got these <laughs> signets that have been... Along the river this summer, there's a breeding pair and seven cygnets. Well, now they are completing up. This is going to be the problem for you guys. They get really aggressive because mm. they expect you to feed them. Yeah. So the first they're time, very, they're very clever. I think everyone yeah. knows the ones at March, especially this sort of. There's always a pair up Wigston's end, and they literally like they walk swim past you like with their eye looking at you, and then when you're not looking, they sort of come round the back and try and get behind you, sort of platform and try and get it from that side um but you know these ones are aggressive if you don't feed them they're the 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 mature male and there's one of the signets is a huge bird must be another male they get really really aggressive yeah. it's because they see people on the bridge and they power back mm. towards them and the people on the boats feed them what about the geese? Are they still about? I haven't seen the geese, but they must be further down. Yeah, yeah I, I think they live Teletubby land near the yeah. back of the yeah. library there, don't they? <laughs> I walked through there, oh, I don't know, a long time, it, probably, I don't know, June time. <laughs> Teletubby it, land. Yeah, that's what they call it, don't they? Yeah. I don't know. That's what it looks like, Teletubby land with the hills. And <laughs> you'll know when people go past it, they go, yeah, it is Teletubby land, outside the acre anyway. And um, there was just... Goose grumble everywhere. It was it was bad, really. The council hadn't cleaned it up. I know geese have been uh, charging at people going to the library. Well, there's, yeah. they must be living there now. Then. Yeah, I tell you what, these swans. I've seen them, and I've seen them do it a lot, not just once. They go up to certain boat narrow boats, mm. and again the male will bang on the window mm. of the boat, and he makes this noise. It's like a it's like something out of a. I don't know, Jurassic Park. It's right. really weird. You'll see me in the match. Velociraptor type it, thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the people in the boat open the window and chuck the bread out. Yeah. He's actually calling them to feed them. 
So it's amazing. So these birds are pretty cute, and uh, it's going to be interesting the first match you have because you're going to catch loads of fish, but someone's going to get attacked by the swans as well. Yeah. Because they are really aggressive at the minute. Mm. So uh, that's going to be all fun and games, and someone's going to um, it's going to get their leg pulled somewhat afterwards. On I thought, but that'd be good. I reckon that sixty pound weight. Could... Fifty. Fifty pound. Was that the record? fifty two pound? I think winners had last year. Yeah. Yeah, we'll I see. I wouldn't be surprised if that went. Yeah. It's heaving. I had a walk, I had a bike. I think I took my van for a service and a bike back home and um, I biked along the river. Funnily enough, didn't have to go that way, but somehow the bike took me that way. You know, along the river and it was noticeable that there was a lot of skimmers in the river, especially under the town bridge. Um, I know a local lure angler. He's been spinning under there, catching some lovely perch and. He's been catching so many rud on lures. Yeah. Which is mental. You said to me last year that these fish had got bigger from the previous year. Yeah. They're, they're the same fish, but they're bigger. They are, They're definitely. bigger now. Yeah, yeah. The rud we're catching out of here now are all between two and four ounces. Yeah. They're not like the little fag packet jobs. Yeah. And they're going to be big weight builders in a match. Yeah. And there's so many of them, it's incredible. Yeah. That's I think it'd be stuff. interesting to see... Um, there's a lot more people cutting on to these mitten crabs now. Uh, I tell you, I saw one the other day. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm coming on to it. So, um, a lot of people don't realise how many of them are about and um, how it might affect the fish feeding and stuff like that. I mean, what sort of bottoms they like and where they move and stuff like that. So, it'd be interesting to see what Spalt makes of it all and areas that. He's coming back on. Yeah, we've yeah. got to get him back on. I saw him, I popped in to see him last week. Um, yeah, I was drop shotting. Just I was bored. Just took my drop shot out just to see what it looked like in the water, mm. and something went after it. I thought, oh, what's that? It's a bloody mitten crab mm. going big, after. Aren't they? It, it was a. It was about the size of one that Spot brought around here. Yeah. But it was. It was actually going for the lure. Thinking. So I actually, I tried, I tried. Obviously, I tried to catch it. Yeah. Did, don't you? And it just scuttled along, and I thought, I've not seen one of those in here before. But then you think, you're right. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a hell of a lot. Yeah. yeah. He was telling me of a, a waterway that he's been picking them off the bank. Mm. Well, there's a lot in the tidal trend now as well. Yeah, they've got um, a hell of a lot. Yeah. So, not good. Nope. Right, buddy, I think we're nearly there, aren't we? Yeah, I'm yeah. nearly ready for bed, I am. Oh, well, yeah. I'll, I've taken my ice pack off my back. I, need, I, need, I don't know what I need. I think I need a new body. Mm. getting old. But, uh, right. Good luck, everybody. Fishing next weekend. Let's hope... All the match results are superb. It's um, the time of year when the fence really starts coming onto form, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, I reckon another, another three weeks and that's prime time for yeah. Finland for everything, really. Yeah. Pie cans. Bit of colour. Yeah. Well, maybe. I don't know maybe if colour's a good thing anymore. Who knows? Let's just go fishing. Yeah. Right, thanks Alex, as always. And uh, thanks everybody listening. This has been Tales from the Tackle Shop, a Fenland Fishing TV production.